This will be the first of a series of videos on object-oriented programming in Python. I will be covering topics like classes, objects, the difference between functions and bound methods, inheritance, special methods, properties, etc. I'm also planning to cover some of the intermediate or advanced level concepts like the descriptor protocol, their relationship with properties and methods, how the class itself is created, and metaprogramming. Along the way, I will try to cover the thought process like when to write classes, the patterns of special methods, best practices, and idioms. This is not a complete beginner course, I expect the viewer to have done some Python programming. First, let's try to understand what is an object in the context of object-oriented programming. Objects usually will have some state and some related behavior, just like real-world objects. For example, here is how we represent a bicycle as an object. Here, the state can be the current speed and gear. Change gear and brake are behaviors. When we write this as code, it gets translated into something like this. Don't focus on the specifics here, try to see the pattern. There are some fields we use to track the current state of our object. We modify the internal state of the object using some methods. These methods are what we saw as behavior in the conceptual image. In Python, we usually use the term attribute to identify both fields and methods. For example here, speed, gear and change gear are all attributes. The class we wrote is like a template to create an object. We use the class to create objects. They are also called instances of the class. Here we are creating two bicycle objects and calling the change gear method of them with different values. It changes their gear field. Notice that each bicycle object has its independent copy of the internal state or fields. One difference between the objects in Python and many other languages is that Python doesn't have private fields. In many other languages, the fields that we use to represent the internal state of the object like gear and speed here will be private unless you explicitly make them public. The only way to access or modify the state will be using the methods. For example, if Python had private fields like those languages, the pattern to access or modify the internal state of the objects be something like this. For each private field, you will need methods to get and set values. In Python, we can access or modify them directly. Even though Python's way of keeping all fields public makes it easy to write and read the code, there are some advantages to having private attributes. You can achieve those benefits in Python also, it's just that Python's approach is different. We will discuss them in detail when we start looking into properties. Even though Python doesn't have private attributes, developers use some conventions to indicate that a field is private by prefixing the name of the field with an underscore. For example, here we indicate that the gear attribute is a private field, and the user of the class shouldn't modify it directly. You can still access it and modify it directly, but if you modify it, then it's your problem if the code doesn't work properly. Some magic happens when you name your attribute with double underscores. Notice the speed attribute here. If you look at the instance dictionary, you will see that the underscore gear field is stored as it is. There is no double underscore speed attribute. Instead, it was renamed by adding the class name as the prefix. This is not for making a variable private, we will discuss more on its purpose when we discuss inheritance. I will also cover more details on the instance dictionaries in future videos. Next thing I would like to cover is when to write classes. There are languages where you have to write classes to do anything at all. But that's not the approach you should take when writing Python. In Python, you don't even have to define a main function. You can simply start writing the actual code. After you write some amount of code like this, you will see some patterns, for example, some code being used multiple times. That's when you move that part of the code into functions. It's better to write functions such that they do just one thing, and their name should be descriptive enough to remember what they are doing. So when you read your code, you should be able to recall what the getStatus function does without looking into the code in the function body every time. So one of the purposes of writing a function is to have a logical grouping of the code. Suppose that we want to know whether the status code of a website changed from what we saw in the last check. For example, if the website returned 200 status code in the previous check, 
and returns 500 now, we like to be notified. We have a few websites for which we would like to know this. To implement this, when we check the current status of the website, we need to remember what was the last status for the same website. These kinds of situations where we need to keep track of a state are where we use classes. We don't need to focus on the specifics or logic. I would like you to see the pattern here. When we want to keep track of a state, we use the classes so that each instance or object created from the class will have its own state. Methods you define the class can be thought of as the behavior of these objects.